Uh, all right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the June um, Southern Fry DNN user group meeting. Uh, glad to have everybody online and here in the room in person. Uh, I know myself, uh, my own crew, I've got a couple of people joining from the office as soon as they get a chance to get on. So um, it's the middle of the summer. It's hot here in North Carolina. Uh, we're really feeling that, uh, that southern heat right now. Um, so we're, uh, you know, appreciating that it's the middle of the summer and anybody who's joining us, uh, thanks for joining online or, uh, or making it out here uh, to see us. Uh, tonight we have a few different things that we're going to run through. I'm going to start off by uh, thanking sponsors and running through a, a few different um, points uh, of, of events that have happened since the last month or so. But uh, we do have Ash Prasad uh, here with us. Uh, he's uh, chimed in online and we're going to have him uh, give a presentation in just a few moments. Uh, but to uh, kind of, and I am sharing screen now, um, yeah, yeah. David, all right. Uh, just to run through a, a little bit about what we have on tap tonight, uh, the title of today's session is How Important is DNN Security? Uh, whether you've just heard about it and seen a few different things uh, popping around online or you've been directly affected about it, uh, this month and last month have been uh, very active with a lot of security-related uh, activity, both positive and negative, uh, happening in the DNN sphere. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to have some experts uh, give us some good word about new modules that have been released and uh, things that you can do. And I'm going to, uh, for better or worse, uh, share with you my own experiences and firsthand knowledge of uh, what to do when you're cleaning up after a security breach. Um, but uh, so to jump into just a couple of other things, uh, we don't want to mention uh, our sponsors. Uh, we uh, are always um, relying on our sponsors to help uh, promote the event, to help supply us with items that uh, really, you know, make this uh, event something that uh, people are excited to join. And uh, tonight we have uh, JetBrains as our primary sponsor. Uh, they signed up again for another year and we can't thank them enough. So to begin with, we have to uh, say thank you so much to the folks at JetBrains. <clears throat> we have one we have one giveaway item for JetBrains here uh, today. Um, looks like we got one guy outside. Uh, if Michael, okay. you want to go catch him and bring him in. Um, uh, we do have a giveaway uh, for the end of the night. Um, Clint, how are we handling that? Do we have raffle tickets? Are we going to grab numbers? We got raffle tickets. All right. So we've got raffle tickets. We'll be assigning numbers online so that uh, folks can also participate. Uh, so if you are joining us online, make sure to stick around for the end of the meeting uh, because that uh, makes you eligible for this uh, JetBrains giveaway, which uh, is pretty sweet. Uh, it is a free license for your choice of item. And uh, I believe we've had several different folks win them and it's a pretty exciting uh, thing to have. So uh, JetBrains, primary sponsor for tonight. Uh, Want to move into community buzz and announcement information and thank uh, Grant for uh, coming in. Um, we have had our most recent uh, DNN community related event uh, just finished occurring in Spain. It was a, a gorgeous event and a gorgeous place to be. And uh, for anybody that was uh, lucky enough to get uh, there, we'd love to hear the stories. Um, at the moment, uh, we don't have anybody on hand uh, to uh, relay to us. And um, I think we'll look for a, a recap. So if, if you went to DNN Connect and you'd like to step up and give us five to 10 minutes of a recap, uh, at our next uh, July meeting, we'd love to have you join us, uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, do you want to share a couple of different things? I can tell you what the Iceland airport is like da inside. David Poindexter has some <laughs> harrowing stories about uh, what the Iceland airport looks like in, in, in closed holding cell type uh, venues. Um, but uh, really, if anybody wants to give us a recap, we'd love to hear some personal stories about what you experienced and uh, how gorgeous it was. Um, they have put up online a few of the different videos, uh, so I did want to mention that uh, from both Microsoft's Channel 9 and from the DNN Connect location, uh, you can catch the opening keynote, you can catch uh, the DNN Connect version of what Joe gave us last month, which was the Thinking Outside the Box um, session, but uh, there are a lot of different videos that you're able to go through. Uh, we'll also link up to those on our Southern Fried site so we can help promote them uh, and get them out there. Uh, but I uh, did want to mention that uh, it was a fantastic event, and if we can get some more personal stories, can't wait to hear those. Clint. Tell the people in the chat that, that pay attention 
to, or the people on GoToMedia need to pay attention to the chat because she's going to assign tickets virtually through the chat. Bingo. Uh, you probably heard that over the microphone, um, but for those that are joining us online, do pay attention to the chat. Uh, aside from having a running peanut gallery where you can heckle all of us, um, David's going to sign out ticket numbers uh, for each of you individually so that uh, you can be included in this uh, JetBrains uh, giveaway uh, that we're having at the end of the session. Uh, so we had Dean and Connect, a successful community event. Um, I want to talk briefly about an external uh, community event. This is not .NET Nuke related uh, specifically, uh, but anybody who works heavily inside of the ASP.NET community is familiar with Nathaniel Jones's um, ASP.NET image resizer. Many, many, many of us have been using it without knowing because he didn't have it locked down with license that forced you to pay. It was a, you know, an honorware. You paid for what you were using and he made a living off of producing it. Um, he has been working on a cross-platform version that is called ImageFlow and he's put it up as a Kickstarter uh, so that everyone can pitch in. Even if you can pitch in five or ten dollars, we can make this thing happen. And it's already more than halfway there. Um, there are a lot of other folks from the DNA community that are helping champion this. Uh, myself, I pitched in uh, 500 bucks. It's not a lot, but it's enough to get me a license and I'm able to use it as an enterprise level developer so I can use it in all of my projects. Um, but I feel good about it because I know I've used and benefited from this over time and I want to give back in any way that I can. Um, Kelly Ford with uh, XMod Pro has heavily uh, put into it and is also promoting it. Uh, so I wanted to take a moment to also mention it, that if you uh, know about the image uh, resizer for ASP.NET, if you are um, you know, needing something that could be server-based and then is going to be cross-platform with a lot of different features to it, uh, ImageFlow is the new Kickstarter project, and I'll have a, a brief note and a mention about that on the website and recap of today's meeting as well. Um, all right. Well, without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Ash to um, speak with us as our first guest speaker. Um, as I mentioned a few moments ago, there's been a lot of uh, hubbub about DNN security. Um, there was a uh, larger notice last summer uh, when the um, issue with the image folder, or the install folder, and the ASP.NET files, uh, the install, the install wizard, the upgrade wizard, uh, were potentially available there for some type of exploit, so we were all encouraged to lock that down. Uh, well, here this summer it uh, has turned into reality and it's blossomed, and we not only see it being exploited, um, many people are seeing firsthand uh, how that is being exploited, and I'll, I'll run through some examples after, uh, after this. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ash is well known in the community. I'm going to uh, pass over to him and have him uh, kind of give an introduction and talk uh, in general about DNN security, but then also I assume, or, or I'm looking forward to uh, a little bit about the new uh, release uh, of the uh, security analyzer uh, that was updated here right at the beginning of the month. Uh, so Ash, thank you very much for joining us. Let me switch over and have you uh, swapped as presenter and... Uh, Thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Everybody here is okay? Yeah, you guys can see my screen and hear me okay? You are in great shape. Okay, sounds very good. So thank you very much, Ryan, for the warm welcome and introduction. So uh, today my topic is how important is DNN security? So the, the agenda is we'll talk a little bit about me. Uh, we'll recap the incident that happened here and how DNN Corp uh, responded to that. Uh, what happened with regards to product releases? Uh, after that, uh, the security bulletin, the security analyzer release, and at the end we'll talk about a little bit about our security email alias. Uh, so let's get started. So I work at the DNN as Director of Engineering, so I look after uh, pretty much uh, the engineering, as pretty much every aspect of engineering at DNN would include the platform, uh, the commercial product, uh, uh, yeah, so, so any, anything that ships from, from us, uh, I, I oversee that. Um, I've been with the company for a bit now. I was the one that I, the, who implemented the DNN search back in 7.1, and that gave me the opportunity to become a co-author of the DNN 7 book. 
So, Clint, it's not, there is no upcoming book. I just updated my Twitter profile. Uh -huh. um, it is, uh, <laughs> yeah, because I said that I'm an author of an upcoming book that was a long time back, and I know Clint is a co-author there as well, and in fact, he introduced me, me to, uh, to the book, so yeah, thanks, thanks for that. So I'm a co-author there uh, because of my contribution in DNN uh, in the open source world. Microsoft recognized that, and they gave me the MVP title. Uh, this is my second year in going. My Twitter handle is Ashish Prasad, so feel free to tweet if you like the presentation. So recap, recap of the incident. So this started to happen somewhere around the third week of May 2016, that is last month. And what we noticed was that people were started to post uh, some weird behaviors in the DNN forums, the MVP forums, and we also started to get some tickets. Uh, from customers, we have uh, a, a very active support organization that is also run from the Vancouver office, which is where I'm located. Uh, the DNS main office is located in San Mateo, California. Uh, so I happen to sit next to the support team, and uh, they told us that they had about six, seven or eight uh, tickets with a very similar symptom. Uh, and the symptom was the SMTP setting was getting reset. And when I got the first one, yeah, we said, you know, this is something, it, probably a bug somewhere. Uh, not, not, you know, I wasn't really paying attention at that time, but when we saw six or seven tickets, and it all exploded in, in terms of the community, uh, uh, people started to say they were seeing some uh, weird logs in the event viewer, uh, some weird activities in IS logs. So we felt there was something going on. This is something. Uh, some, something different. So what we did was that we formed a team very quickly. As soon as we realized that there is there is a problem, we formed a team very quickly. We started analyzing logs from customers, uh, forums, the DNN MVPs, and a few other online places. A lot of information was coming in, and initially there was a bit of confusion as to where the vulnerability was. Um, we also found that this is a bot that was running. It was not someone going one by one by hand. So we found that uh, it was a systematic uh, bot that was uh, somehow they got a list of the DNN sites. Uh, we were able to confirm that it's not from us, uh, uh, but there are ways you can get get that list online somehow. So, and they were exploiting that, um, and then we actually identified a couple of sites from which the traffic for the bot was coming and we were able to get them uh, shut down. And uh, as soon as we realized that there is a problem, we, the first action that we did was uh, the, that we sent out a newsletter uh, with manual step to correct. Uh, the suspicion was uh, the install wizard uh, the install wizard.aspx file, but as a precaution, we asked the people to delete other install related files that are no longer needed. Uh, so uh, what happened was that we continued to monitor. We actually got some false positive information as well that there, are, there might be other vulnerabilities besides install wizard.aspx. So we had to spend a little bit of time uh, to comb through those and confirm. Uh, so as soon as we confirmed that that's where the vulnerability was, uh, we the development team started working on a patch. The patch was actually very simple, uh, but given such a large code base and the large number of features, we still had to go through the a testing cycle. So it took us about half a day to close to close uh, a day to make sure that the builds we're generating is the right build. So there's always a chance of error um, when you do things so fast. Uh, the build numbers, the version numbers, we obviously use all kind of automated tools, but again, there are some configuration changes that needs to be done. So we're, we're able to, to, to finally get the release out on, uh, uh, actually before we got the release out, uh, Will Morganwick, he released a blog on May 26th, uh, which says critical security update, please read, and it also goes and, and suggests the steps that you need to take to uh, to look for the problem and do cleanup. That was May 26th. Mm -hmm. I believe that was Tuesday or Wednesday. And then the yeah on Thursday night, uh, 
May 26, we were able to release uh, DNN Platform 803 and the corresponding evoked releases. They're all tested, they're all up uploaded and deployed. And then at the same time, we also released the security bulletin. A security bulletin is on, on our DNN software website. The security ID or the bulletin ID is 2016-06, where we also explained um, what are the problems, uh, what are the preconditions, which builds or which, which versions are installed. Uh, so that was released. Uh, let's take a pause. I'm going to pause real quick and just uh, show you those blogs and the security bulletins that came along. Yep. So this is the blog I was talking about. That's from, from Well. It outlines uh, what happened and uh, very simple steps as to what you need to do to take care of it. Essentially, you have to clean these files so that the vulnerability is gone. But if you're compromised, then you still need to look into search for files and folders and, uh, and, and clean, clean them up. So after that, so we continue to get feedback, a lot of feedback, and by the way, thanks to everybody that, that, that sent feedback. So we not only got like, okay, yes, this is the symptom, we got the log files, people sent us IS logs, and uh, we continue to look into the patterns in terms of uh, what is going on and how we can help our community and customers uh, with this right now uh, and in future as well. So uh, we decided to make an update to the security analyzer tool. Uh, this tool was released sometime last year where the uh, purpose of this tool was to have it stand alone so that this can be deployed on older versions of DNN. At, at that time, that tool was deployed that was uh, compatible with DNN version 6.2. Uh, and we continue to we continue to support that version even in the last release. So it took us a little bit to to build the tool or to improve this tool and do testing uh, and and get feedback from community and the uh, hosting providers as DNN DNN platform. A few customers also deployed that uh, this tool and and gave us some feedback. So uh, let's take a quick look into the tool and what are some of the new features that were added or new checks that were added. So I'm going to actually refer to the blog uh, that I wrote and uh, that explains it really well. I'll just spend about a few minutes here and kind of go through the important areas, important aspects of the updates on the tool. Uh, so here's the blog. You can go into the inner software, the section and the community blog. You will find it somewhere at the top right now. So essentially the tool has a bunch of tabs. Actually I do have the tool here running on an older version of DNN. This is DNN 742. That's why you're seeing critical updates here. So it has a few tabs. Uh, the first tab is where we added a few checks, audit checks. Uh, and then we added some more tabs and I'll talk about all of that but let's just stick to the tab, the first tab which is audit check and uh, we added uh, the first thing we found was that after the attack uh, the the attacker was changing default.aspx and generally speaking adding a an iframe uh, an iframe with a link to another site uh, sort of a, I think based on what we can tell is that they're trying to get some traffic back to uh, to certain sites or do a pop-up or something like that we, we saw that the iframe had a, an affiliation code, so it's essentially the intent at that time was to generate revenue out of different websites. That's what we could tell. Yeah. So they did tamper the default.aspx. So the first thing we did was that we will check whether the default.aspx or the default.aspx.cs files are changed. These are these two files are the one that actually run the DNN website. So that's that check. Uh, we also noticed that uh, uh, this was a little bit harder to Ash, in a few moments, I'll uh, show some real examples of not only the iframe and the code of that, but I'll also show the pop-ups that uh, we were able to experience uh, across the board on several sites. So we'll have some examples of that in a minute. Sounds, 
Okay, thank you, Ryan. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably I don't want to go too deep in, deep into that. So thanks for the heads up. So uh, on the on the module side, yeah, the headers and the footers they were updated. It was a little bit subtle to to identify, but thanks to our uh, our customers and community, they were able to uh, to help us out with that. But we also added additional check to look for your pass password format. I believe we made this a default change. I guess about two to three years back, where we want you to have hashed password in your DNN system, what it means is that uh, you cannot decrypt that. Uh, so definitely read up a little bit if your site does not have that. But anyway, the tool will give you an indication whether uh, wh whether this is uh, set up correctly or not. Uh, we also went ahead and did some check uh, the disk access. Now we're still fine tuning this. We're getting some uh, we're, we're getting some feedback still from uh, people who are using it. Uh, I believe T. Joe Brinkman is going to blog about it the next next week about how to properly set up file permissions and also the SQL permissions. So we also went ahead and uh, do a quick check on whether you whether the SQL account that you're running does that have uh, more permission that you really need. So these are some examples you will see if you have not con configured it correctly. Uh, we will have more information the coming week. The other thing what we noticed was that the hacker was uh, uh, modifying the allowed file extension and perhaps putting ASPX here and uh, uploading a file to do further exploits. So we are we also put a check here to make sure that this is not being modified. In some cases, you might have uh, you might have changed that on purpose. So it uh, if, if that is the case, it's okay. Uh, but we want you to warn and have a look there. So with that, the new tabs uh, that we added was, uh, these are again very precautionary tabs to, for you to have some visual inspection of the state of some of the files or the settings uh, to see if something is, um, is out of ordinary there. So what we show here is that the recent files that were modified, and we categorize them into two sections. One was high risk, and the other one was low risk. So high risk are things like any ASPX file, any file that has the ability to run. Uh, and if they have been modified recently, you want to take a look and compare with if you had a backup in the past, compare with that. Or if you had original or download the version of DNN you're running and just do a comparison to see if, if they've been tampered or not. Uh, what we've also seen is that the attacker might actually go and update the modified time in back in time. So it may not be apparent here. Uh, so yeah, I think that's something we need to keep in mind. It was a good idea to compare with a good known backup, say from April. At that time, there were no attack, known attack at least. Uh, then low risk files is just about any file that were changed recently. It's a good idea to come here and take a look and see what's going on in your system, and see if uh, you know if something is unusual here. And likewise, we there are lots of internal settings. Uh, we noticed that the attack had made some changes to the to the settings and uh, we we're listing some of the changes that were done recently into either the portal, the host or the tab or the module and uh, just see for yourself see if something looks weird here. Uh, again we're not uh, marking anything here as a warning or an error. It, it, it's more for visual inspection. I'll do a run quickly, show this tool in in operation. Uh, and then we also, as soon as you install the, the tool, we delete a variety of installed files. We believe that they are not needed after uh, after the installation is done, um, and uh, they will get redeployed when you upgrade. But we, we also know that some people use installed on ASPX to, for example, this file to do ad hoc installation. Yep. Although the system supports it, I don't recommend that having that on a production side. We don't recommend that, and that's why we've taken it out. People want to bring it back. They, they can, but it's uh, it's not recommended. Uh, so the new version is 802, and there's a lot of other information about uh, uh, where to download the tool. I will also acknowledge various people in community, like Will Stoll is in the call right now, providing feedback uh, on on the tool itself. We've got lots of comments here. And real quick, uh, uh, where where to download the tool? It's on the GitHub. It's under DNN Community. Security Analyzer uh, tool, and the way to download the tool is you have to go into the releases. 
this is the source code, this is the releases, and you would have to just download the one with the latest release. Right now it's 802, and uh, you will, from time to time, the idea here is that uh, we will have a separate release cycle on this, and that's why it's a standalone tool. And community is more than welcome to contribute. This is a community tool. Uh, we are obviously going to test and verify everything but more than happy to, to take your contribution either through pull request or issue creation. Um, and then the last thing is uh, just want to quickly show you how the tool runs. Uh, I have, I think I want to just focus on one thing here that's very easy to demonstrate. The SQL Server is telling me that I'm running it as sysadmin and what I'm going to do is that the account that I'm running here, my web application, it's uh, it's a local SQL Server account, and I had, being a developer, we give sysadmin permission. So I have sysadmin here. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna remove that, and you would see I'm gonna rerun the tool. So you would see here this is a warning. Uh, it will go away. This is the second last item, and uh, rerunning is just refreshing the page. And now it's a green tick. So, but but there are more checks there, and we will provide more details in upcoming blogs. And uh, real quick, this is an existing feature. You can search for text within files. This search looks for every file in your system, including DLL. Um, and then it also looks for database. It looks for the stuff in database to see if there are some uh, some, some unusual text there. Uh, it will not be able to tell you whether it is really compromised or not, but you would have to see for yourself. Likewise, we have a section here to show the super user activities. This is an existing behavior in the tool. Now, here is what I was saying, that we added a section for recently modified, and you would have to click it. It may take a bit longer to run, depending on your site is. This is mine is a default site. It runs very fast. And you're seeing the file listed, the timestamp over here, and that way you can tell, you can see uh, if uh, the files have been modified. Now, recently modified settings, it comes right away. And again, you need to know, you need to know a little bit about the, how DNN works to understand it. Um, so if you're a customer, open up a ticket. If you are a community member, ask a question in the forums. Uh, someone will answer it um, to see if you find something that you're not able to understand. So, Ryan, with that, I think I'm ending my part of presentation. And if people have any questions, comments, more than happy to answer. Um, Ash, I, I was going to ask you to uh, just mention for a moment the version numbers uh, of the uh, security analyzer for the folks that are online, um, if they paid attention to the original being the 1X uh, now changing up. Right. So, yeah, the current version is 8.02. And I'll give you the reason. It, it started with 1.0 and 1.02 and 1.01. Uh, we have to make a jump to version 8 because when we released DNN 8.0, um, well, so we actually started shipping as part of the DNN platform as well, 7.42 and 8.0. Uh, we happened to bump the version of this tool to 8.0 as well. It was not necessarily needed, but that as a part of cleaning up every module, we cleaned up the version number of this and bumped it to 8.0. But there was no no change actually, just a change in the version number. So now we were kind of once you bumped it, you're stuck with it. So so it will have its own versioning life going forward. Uh, it's right now at 802. Uh, 802. It is. Uh, we've already got some pull requests. We might do an 803 soon and 804 as well, uh, but right now it's 802. Yeah. So it is backward compatible to all the way to DNN 6.2. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a question coming in from the chat side. What is that, uh, Clint? It says, does this version use SHA-1 hashing for passwords with deprecation of SHA-1? Will that have an impact? Um, I, I'm not sure you heard 100% of that, Ash, but the question was, um, I think the person was assuming that the security analyzer does the hashing or the encrypting, and they were asking whether this uses SHA-1 um, or not with the deprecation of that. Um, so maybe speak to this just a little bit to explain to them that this, this tool itself doesn't do hashing. Yeah, this tool, so there are two types of hashing that's going on. 
uh, what so for example if you go here on the default ASPX file this is the, the way we detect the file is changes through an MD5 hash. Uh, so that is different. Uh, so we, we went back into all the previous version and uh, built the MD5 and simply the one that you have on your site for the version. And if they match, then, then it's good. If they don't match, then we flag it. But I believe the question is coming from here about the membership provider. I think the uh, I think the, the hashing here is ACHA1, but I believe you can change that by tweaking the web config setting. Um, I don't have all the details right now, but I do remember getting a question asked recently on that, because ACHA1 is also older. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what about changing it now? <laughs> I don't remember where to change that, so uh. we, we could try that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, uh, Will, uh, you're speaking to the pain points that we've all had when we try to change the, uh, yeah. the hashing sometimes. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll do a session where we talk about how to safely maneuver that uh, careful process without blowing up any ability to recover the site after you change it. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, just so you know, the password hashing works going forward. So if you had any changes any password that was saved in, with a different format, so clear text or encrypted, they remain. They will remain working, though they will remain insecure as well. Uh, when you change this web config changes setting, it only changes when you're storing it or changing it, uh, but not not the previous password. So it won't it won't break your uh, existing. It should not break. But but I agree. We should do a separate session. Totally yeah. agree. Uh, I think we have another question from chat, uh, David, no, not from or, chat from, or from David. Um, yeah. Hey, Ash, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the DNN Packager. That's a NuGet package out there to try to help with module, module development. But one of the things that it does is it has a command in it to remotely install the module. So it's a disconnected development model where you can initiate a, a NuGet command that's part of this NuGet package, and it installs the module. And the way that it has done that, historically has been using install.aspx. Mm -hmm. Now, as of 8.0.3, that is broken because that file doesn't exist anymore. Is there another method by which we could instantiate a, a module installation disconnected like that through a NuGet package, or do we need to kind of rethink that? Yeah, David, I think that, that one came up as well in the past. Uh, you know, recently people ask questions about it, but I think we're going to have to rethink how we do it, how we provide that capability without compromising security. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you would realize if you had accidentally put a module there and someone were to execute that, it would just, you know, execute the URL, it will just run that module. So, yeah, we, we, I mean, yep. you know, with security, <laughs> things are going to get hardened up a bit. Yeah. yeah, is there a possibility that for a dev environment we could have an option I've got you to not install, I mean not to delete install.spx? Because right now that file is removed in an 8.0.3 install right. by default, and rightfully so, but we would love from a development standpoint to be able to not do that. Uh, I also know other hosts, PowerDNN uses that file exclusively for them to run their own powered installs and upgrades. Uh, so it's, it's, it's something that the community definitely does use for powerful purposes intentionally. So it's some, plenty right. of people are trying to figure it out. It'd be nice to have yeah, so I mean, you know, So, uh, you know, I have a feeling when you bring back the file into the install folder, things will just work by itself. So what we're doing is that we're deleting it from the default install, but if you're in a dev environment, you would want to bring that file copy it from the source or somewhere and just put it in there, and that, that will continue to work. I see. So you're saying from the actual source package, we could just pull that back in and it should be okay in a dev environment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pull that back in and you should be okay. That's a good, good point. You, you could you. also place it, run it, remove it. And it'd be part of your action is placing it back in to run and then remove it afterwards. True, but we would have to keep that file in the NuGet package. Which right. Would be <laughs> yeah, you would have to do something like, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from, uh, from chat or the crew? 
All right. Well, Ash, uh, thank you very much for uh, for spending this time with us and running through this uh, very timely and, and important information. Do uh, you have any other closing remarks uh, before we switch into the next uh, uh, segue session? Uh, no, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to be able to speak with the community and everybody and feel free to invite me again for a future session. So thank you very much. Absolutely will. Thank you. Uh, if you want to hang on, we'll still keep uh, talking about the topic. We'd love to have you chime in, uh, especially when uh, we talk about some of the things that I experienced with my own company's uh, DNN instances. And um, uh, you, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of start my session uh, by mentioning that uh, I reached out to Ash by uh, using the security at uh, email address. Uh, actually, that's something that, Ash, you mentioned in the beginning, but I don't think you came back around to it again. Yeah, um, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I was just going to mention that, yeah, security at dnnsoftware.com is, is the way to contact us for any security question. They're all a group of very senior people looking into that, monitoring it. We've actually gone ahead and put in a... A, a tool behind it uh, that so we can track it and uh, and provide status and a ticket number when you now when you send an email to security you'll actually get a ticket number and uh, it's and, and that way we can track in what is the status or things are not going to get missed sometimes in the past it was just email based now there's actually a proper tool so yeah if there's any question we take it very seriously and and uh, we'll, re we'll reply uh, less than 24 hours. If it is critical, we'll reply right away. All right. Well, so um, my portion of the session here, and uh, David, let me know if I have the uh, screen share uh, running correctly here. Um, but I never know how to get rid of this. Close the window for right now? All right. Um, basically, I uh, am going to be sharing a, a fair bit of personal information here about uh, what's happened to our company as we went through things uh, at the end of last month. Um, what you're seeing on screen at the moment is the starting point of the blog post that I'm going to put up here on both the Southern Fried site and then onto the DNN um, software website as well uh, once I post uh, blogs over there. Um, so I'm going to use this. It's not finished at this point. You're going to see a bunch of notes, uh, misspellings, and bullet points, uh, but I'm going to use them as talking points uh, to run through this, uh, this session and the things I want to show off to everybody today. Um, but uh, essentially my story starts uh, in that we have uh, four or five different hosting locations uh, for our different client websites, and um, around the 21st or the 22nd of last month, we began getting our first inklings that something strange was occurring, that we were starting to see some strange traffic or some strange requests or questions coming in from our clients. And uh, similar to what uh, what Ash mentioned, he, there was confusion at first. There was not quite sure what was going on. Maybe something was a fluke. Maybe something was uh, just a miscellaneous uh, occurrence. Uh, but within a day, we were on fire. Uh, we were having every single one of the clients on that particular server that was compromised um, calling us, talking to us, uh, demanding instant action and attention, and we were doing, very honestly, our best to keep things uh, afloat and keep moving. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, you know, if, if Ash was talking about this, the clinical nature and, and the elements that you know you have to do for lockdown and some of the tools you can use, I'm going to share real-world experience about what happened, when it happened, and, and how it happened with us, um, and we're going to see some of those examples. Um, to begin with, I want to talk about DNN's history of security. I tell clients all the time that we purposefully sought out and chose DNN back when we first started working with it because it was built by developers with a security focus. And it has maintained that focus. And compared to many other kinds of systems that are out there that get hacked every day, every minute, DNN doesn't. And it's because of a vigilance and an attention to order and security first uh, that it maintains that kind of uh, setup. Um, I can remember only myself uh, in the last eight or so years that I've been working with DNN that there have only been three security related things that I've been through uh, in DNN. The first one was an ASP.NET related item that was not specific to DNN. Uh, this was something that affected all ASP.NET applications, SharePoint, etc. And it was not a, a very specific uh, thing to DNN only. It was the, uh, the Joliet uh, attacking uh, method that was able to happen. Uh, so that was the very first thing that I ever saw happen to uh, DNN instances across the board. 
Uh, the second one was a vulnerability related to the older FCK editor. Um, there was something in that that allowed it uh, through manipulation to uh, allow people to post up files to your server uh, in the folders that it could get access to and uh, then they could serve up content or, or use it. Uh, it was more of an annoyance really than uh, anything much because they weren't able to change or edit your other files. They were just able to upload files to your site, um, steal your bandwidth, post up stuff, use it under your domain. So it was a hassle. Easily fixed by changing out the FCK editor for any other number of editors. And at that point, again, it wasn't really a DNN security error. It was with the FCK editor. Uh, the third one was the one that happened last summer, and uh, that's really the core of what we've all been talking about. Uh, this was raised to all of our attention um, by those blog posts and those security notices from DNN Corporate summer last year in which they said there was the potential for a security exploit. Uh, a vulnerability had been raised as a caution regarding the install folder and the files that were within the install folder. And at that point in time, they already recommended that you just rename those files or remove those files um, because you didn't need them. Uh, myself, I had about 102 DNN instances that I had to run through in the course of a day and a half and make edits and changes to. At that point, I wasn't going to go in and rename a bunch of files or, and I wasn't going to uh, make edits and changes individually to each one, so I did it quick and mass by FTP, and in my case, in those situations, it was easiest for us to simply rename the install folder. By renaming the install folder to install underscore back, or install your initials, or install recurse, or whatever, um, you remove it from direct access by that particular name. At that point, the install folder remains active, and I can use it again. Now, if I load the extensions uh, page, I get this nice big error message up at the top of the extensions page because the extensions page, so I'm talking about here host slash extensions, needs that install folder to be present um, really mainly that I'm aware of uh, because of some language files that are stored inside of that particular location. If those language files are present and everything else is missing out of the install folder, the extensions page will still function and work. Um, but by renaming that, the extensions page breaks, that's okay by me. I know by FTP before I upload some modules, I go back and rename the folder, use it, and then rename it back again. Um, but what happened this uh, time was different. Uh, first off, let me mention uh, just a little bit about how this happened to us, and, and then I'll start going through what happened. Uh, but essentially, we were uh, in a particular server here in which we had probably... 60 to 80 percent of the DNN instances on that server already prepared, already locked down in that their install folders were not publicly uh, accessible. But we had five or six that we were working on concurrently, brand new things. We just put them up a few weeks ago. Every single one of those was hit very, very quickly. And from there, the rest of the server was, was hit. And we had a, a point of going through to check, uh, and I'll bring us some screenshots in a moment, but we had a point to check every single DNN instance on the server, and DNN instances that were stopped, in other words, the IIS website was stopped and not running, still had their files changed. So with the access vulnerability that happened from one DNN instance and uh, the ASP.NET permissions that we had available inside of uh, our location, uh, they were able to cross over multiple other DNN instances, even if they didn't know the domain names, even if those weren't publicly accessible, they still hit those files. Other websites that were not DNN based, that were in the same folders side by side with DNN websites, were skipped. So when Ash mentioned that this was not a human action, that this was a bot action, uh, that was one of my first clues that this was a bot action because they were very specifically hitting DNN structure and DNN instances. Uh, and once they got in, they went and crawled for more DNN instances. And those were the only things that they went and they hit. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what happened and uh, talking about this, this hacking instance. Uh, so forgive me again. Um, I'm going to be going back and forth with these materials that I've, I've pulled together. I didn't exactly have time for a presentation, so I'm going to... Uh, run through them a, a few at a time. Um, just for the fun of it, I'll show uh, my very first experience with a site being hacked. Uh, this was a DNN4 website way back when. Um, and this particular one was uh, hacked because 
in doing something for the client and getting FTP running, we accidentally made a whole folder wide open. Anybody could post something to this location. Uh, we learned some good lessons from that, of course. Um, but uh, in this particular website, uh, somebody went through and replaced all of the photos with jihad-based photos. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the time hacking is mundane. I've had sites uh, suddenly have uh, iframe or footer type things pop up with um, uh, e gambling websites and um, links to shopping websites and things like that. This was probably the only one that I ever had that was uh, you know, kind of racy and, and exciting from uh, the fact that we were a target and we got hit by something. It's a lot less funny or, or racy uh, to me now at this point. Um, so uh, talking about what happened in this particular event starting on the 20th moving forward, uh, we started to get a few comments in from customers. And again, uh, as Ash mentioned, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on at first and you think something's a fluke and a customer calls up and says, Ryan, I'm, I, think your web, I think our website, our, your website is spitting out a virus. Really? I probably don't think that's the case. So I go and I pull up the website. No, the website's not spitting up a virus. It's perfectly fine. It has to be on your computer. You know, what do you have? Let's try it in some different browsers. Let's take a look at a few things. And that client was day one for us. And at that point, that client was, uh, you know, burning us up. Uh, what is going on? We're starting to see this on more people's clients. Or more people's websites. I went to the BNN Con site the other day and got that pop-up. I didn't know what it oh, was. Really? Yeah. This pop-up was the universal pop-up that we saw, but it was very hard to see. We were bringing up the websites that were potentially um, hit, and we were not able to see this. Eventually, we were able to see this, and I have some theories. I don't want to say how smart I think this thing could have been, but uh, it didn't show all the time. Possibly it didn't show to us by our IP address because we were also listed as recent people having logged in as hosts instead of DNN. Clients saw it consistently, but us from our office, we never ever did. But when we went home or we pulled it up on our phones, we instantly were able to see this message. So I don't know how smart it was. Maybe it was cookie based. I, I don't know. I didn't spend time looking into it further from there, but this is what occurred. This opened up as a graphic image that appeared to freeze your machine. It didn't actually freeze your machine. All it did was open up a pop-up on top of your graphic and your Chrome instance or your IE instance was described as being locked. And I don't know how well you can read it uh, down here, but it says, Trojan virus may have already hurt your hard disk and its data. Um, Please call this phone number, toll free, urgent response is needed. We will deal with this problem, etc., etc. This could be described as ransomware. It could be the laziest ransomware I've ever seen because anyone who has a little bit of experience realizes that they could just control out delete and kill this browser and be perfectly fine. But I can't tell that to my mom and pop shop client of a website or the people who are already panicking because in their office now two or three computers that pulled up their website are showing this message. So the intent of it was very real and very solid, even if it was easily, uh, quickly defeatable. Uh, but just to take a look at what, what was happening, uh, we were able to quickly see, once we were able to see a DNN instance and know it was somewhere, and, and uh, again, it was day two, when we had a second client on a different DNN instance, same server, bring up to us the fact that they saw the same thing and they sent us a screenshot. The minute we had two, we knew exactly what was going on, and we started looking hard at the data. Um, so that was the 22nd uh, by the time that really occurred. Um, we were quickly able to see what was going on in, um, as Ash mentioned, the default.aspx uh, file. Essentially here, right above at the uh, end of the body tag, um, or, I'm sorry, the beginning of the, the body tag, uh, basically you have a div uh, in place. Uh, and this div says uh, position absolute, it is 1,000 pixels off to the top, uh, 9,000 off to the left, and it's an iframe. It triggers it and it moves itself over when it's ready to fire. Um, this logs rig rip dot top is the domain uh, that was present in all of ours. Um, maybe Ash can speak to see if this was one of the ones that was common or universal. But as far as we saw it across this instance, this was the, the main domain. And you can see at the end, the credit or the query string uh, that was giving a particular account 
uh, to this as it loaded. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Ryan, it, yes. Yeah, well, we saw, the, I can't remember the exact domain name, but dot .top showed up so many times with an affli affiliate ID. Uh, it might be a variation of this, but this looks very, very familiar. Yep. Um, we saw mostly the same code across all of the default ASPX files. We could also see that they had edited the default ASPX file, not simply replaced it, because we had a few, very few instances where we had some custom code inside of the default.aspx, and this line of code was alongside of it. So it wasn't just that they just replaced that with their own copy, they were editing uh, these particular ones. There was one instance where instead of it being at the top of the body, it was at the bottom of the body. Um, but I throw that one out as, as just a, a variant or maybe a previous attempt. I'm not quite sure. Um, so uh, we went through and began cleaning this out and knowing that we had been hit. And at that point, um, we began to get concerned about what we should do next, what we should look for. Uh, we went into the install folder knowing about this, um, and very shortly afterwards, uh, seeing the blog post on the 26th, uh, really uh, confirming and talking about a lot of the details, <laughs> Um, we were able to pinpoint back um, that in the install folder, in all of the sites that were uh, hit, this install stat.log.resources.txt file. Uh, the back on it is my uh, extension or addition onto it. Uh, but that was the date that this particular one got hit. So at 523 uh, is when this particular DNA instance got hit. If we looked at the defaults.aspx uh, file, it also had the 523 uh, date stamp. This has zero kilobytes in it. There's nothing in the file. I don't know if it's used in part of the process or it's uh, something that just gets tested and updated to see if it's uh, you know, viable and then it moves on from there. Um, but it was present in every one of the DNN instances uh, that uh, was compromised uh, from our standpoint. Um, okay, so uh, heading back over uh, to talk a, a couple of different things. Um, Oh, another piece of the puzzle for us was that um, one of our DNN host users had the password changed on them. Uh, and that was one of the items that was mentioned as a potential uh, thing that had occurred. Um, but uh, kind of just skipping through a, a couple of different th uh, things here, um, what to do now was uh, really our, uh, our concern of trying to figure out what we needed to do. And for me, the primary concern is if they were able to get access to our location and they were able to edit things, that means they got to the web.config. And if they got to the web.config, they have the connection strings for my database SQL server. So at that point, I need to make many different changes across all of these instances. I don't know for a fact that they were able to get into any of those instances. However, for me, wanting to make sure I have peace of mind and check security, it was one of the main things that we started doing very quickly. So at that point, many, many, many DNN instances wise, uh, we went through one at a time, changed the uh, database password, changed it in the web config, restarted the website over and over and over and over and over again. But it's at this point that I mentioned the real pain point of what was going on and the fact that this was bot related is that we weren't simply under normal traffic circumstances making a change or restarting our server and having it come back online again a few moments later we were effectively underneath of a denial of service attack because I could test one of the install folders and rename it from install back to install and within three minutes I had a new file posted on that DNN instance. We were being heavily hit and we were able to see our processor time and our memory usage was maxed out 99-99% as it went through and hit us hundreds of thousands of times over the course of several hours. So it was miserable for us to even get in and make these changes, much less clients having their sites up or down or restarting because we're doing something legitimate versus the server just not being able to support the active traffic that was going on. So um, talking about what to do now, one of the first things that we did to help get out from underneath of that denial of service level of traffic, that, that flood uh, of traffic that we were receiving, was we fouled all of the IP addresses. We took the domains that were present and we pointed them to a brand new IP address that was not set up with DNN instances. Every single one of the domain names, if you hit it, stopped working. 
By IP address, we also remove that IP address, the one that was present previously, from those particular sites so that even if that IP address was being hit directly, it wasn't actually hitting these websites anymore. We redirected it over to a maintenance uh, type of message that had no active uh, work going on. With that off of our shoulders, we were then able to change our own local hosts files to the new IP address and continue working on the websites. I mentioned this as a, as a, as a point because it was, it was the first turning point in what we were battling that we were actually able to continue working. We fouled the IP addresses and made our own way in to each of these sites and stopped the bots from being able to hit them heavily. Um, now, um, I'll, I'll bring that back up again um, when I get towards the end of the, the session because it hit us twice. We had a first initial instance that was really around the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd uh, that was the heaviest hit. Uh, but then this past week, our SQL Server was also hit in a similar set of things, and I'll describe that. Um, but um, I do want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the steps that we went through. Uh, really, with Ash's help and, and guidance on a few different things, we ran through doing manually what is now present inside of the Security Analyzer um, and would have made our, our tasks much, much easier if we had it uh, at that point in time. Um, but we went looking for any files that had changed within that period of time from the date that we saw the um, file change. Uh, but we also went through and um, looked for and looked through all of the files for specific keywords. Um, so um, rootkit was one of the ones that uh, is mentioned there in the security analyzer, and it's mentioned heavily in the um, uh, you know the, the, the text that uh, Ash passed back over. Uh, there were two other ones that were both found in our location. Um, that had been added into files and they were linked to particular things. One of them was IIS spy and the other one is ASPX spy. Now we never found an instance of ASPX spy in our code. However, when we went back to the server logs, I, uh, ASPX spy was the top number one requested file not found with hundreds of thousands of records of it. So it was never uploaded. It was never available. It was never active on our site. However, our denial of service side of, of um, effects and, and, and um, reactions to it was because they were hitting and trying desperately to find those type of files. Now, uh, where we did find the rootkit uh, particular files uh, involved uh, or names or references uh, was in two files placed randomly. One of them inside of the portals zero images folder in which they placed an images.aspx file that referenced the rootkit. Uh, they had also changed, as one of the things mentioned in the security analyzer, they had changed so that ASPX was an available file type that could be uploaded. Um, so there was one images.aspx file that mentioned rootkit, and then there was another generic name ASPX file uh, that referenced the IIS spy. Um, once those were removed, we felt pretty safe, and we've scanned continually for those files again and mentions of those types of records again afterwards. Um, so uh, a lot of manual search to look for uh, these particular things, uh, looking through for any files that have been related uh, or changed recently, running um, virus scanning tools on the server. Uh, there's F-Search, there are a few other virus and malware scanning tools. Uh, we placed them all onto the website, they all came up empty. None of them found any of these things because there were no actual viruses installed on the server. There were references to things that could be activated and things that could be used later. Um, so uh, we had uh, quite a lot of activity, quite a lot of uh, heartache and uh, lost productive time spent battling and locking things down after this uh, vulnerability breach. Um, so talking about security practices and best things to do and really what to do after, um, I want to talk briefly about a few of the other tools that we either invented or that we used. Uh, it, it really sounds like about the same time that the security analyzer was being updated to address a few of these things, we were also running across a few places where our hands were tied and we needed to make edits, uh, so we did so in a couple of different ways. Uh, so uh, I want to mention uh, a couple of different things that we did. Um, for the DNN instances where we have our own server that we can get access to by remote desktop and we can have direct access to, we decided to lock down the install folder permanently. We can leave it called install and we can have all of the ASPX files present there, 
because we are using Windows IP address blocking security to stop external access to that specific folder. Uh, so what I will reference here in later notes is uh, this particular article uh, that describes uh, how you can install and get this set up on your server. Again, this doesn't work for everybody. It only works if A, you have remote desktop access and you can enable this kind of security. But B, more importantly, you have to have an office address or an internet address with a dedicated IP address that's not going to change. If this changes, you're out of luck. So uh, we have this ability in, in our office location, so we're able to lock down uh, things to this specific um, IP address. So I want to take just a moment and show you how to do that and the steps uh, that you go through um, yeah, making this happen. So to begin with, uh, you uh, install this. This is present inside of IIS. Uh, here I'm doing it on Windows 2012 server. It's present, it's just not installed and active by default. <laughs> Uh, so the very first thing is underneath the server manager, we go in and underneath of security, turn on IP and domain restriction. Once that's in place and you restart, uh, you're able to begin using those tools. Um, so here, and again, I, I kind of prepared for this by taking screenshots. That way I wouldn't be trying to log into an active IIS web location um, and give a presentation at the same time. So you're going to see uh, things here. If I got sensitive data in this, I tried to screen some of it out, but... I'm sure I lost something here or there. Let me, let me know in the heckling later. Um, anyways, so once it is turned on, you are able to specifically lock down um, your specific folders. So in this location, we're looking at a particular um, DNN instance. Uh, in this server, there are 30 plus. Um, and you are locking down the IP address restrictions specifically and only for the install folder. The public is not going to be browsing the install folder. So locking this down is perfectly okay. The same button, the same element is available at the top website level. If you accidentally lock down that website level, your whole website's non-browsable uh, except from your IP address. So uh, step number one, click on and make sure you're loading the install folder in this particular location. Uh, once you do, you're able to click on the new item that's uh, present, that is uh, IP, address, um, uh, IP address and domain restrictions. From there, you are able to put in a couple of settings. The very first one is uh, to be able to uh, add an allow entry. By adding an allow entry, you are allowing yourself, your main IP address, uh, the ability to get in. Uh, so from this location, um, I put in one single allow address, and that's my office IP address location. After that, we head back to this. After that, you use the edit feature settings. And this is my particular formula that, that I did that has worked for us. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a variation in just a moment. But you click Edit Feature Settings, and from that point, you are able to set up the default reactions except for this one allow that you've put in. So for our case, we put in Deny, and you have several different action types for Deny. Um, they all give back different types of messages to the user or to the browser. You could make this as, as friendly as you want to. Me, I wanted to stop all denial of service action. Even a small message back with some, some bandwidth, some processor time that I was giving back out. So abort is my choice of preference. Uh, but just to mention what those two uh, look like, a as I mentioned, is that you can choose uh, abort, you can choose forbidden, you can choose deny. Um, let me hit this. Uh, essentially, um, what I did to start this off is I made a test folder to try it out and make sure that I was able to work this out. And from my own office uh, location, I was able to access the file perfectly fine. But if I wasn't in the office IP address location, if I chose uh, abort, then at that point, uh, it's going to give, uh, uh, give up a message and it says, this page isn't working. So it won't let you see the content of that page. Um, I'm sorry, that's, that's forbidden and deny. And, uh, but if you say abort, you get nothing. You just get white nothingness uh, for that page. And so from a human standpoint running across it, you don't get any information back, and neither do you uh, from a, a bot perspective. So um, backing out of this for just a second see what other screens I had to show off. The, um, the use of that allowed us to still keep working and upgrading our DNN instances because from our own location, we could leave the install folder open, we could run and install and start installing new modules and updates to things, but if every three minutes or less we had people checking it to try and see if it was vulnerable, 
we couldn't leave it vulnerable, and this was our best way to keep it so that the external world couldn't see it, but we were still able to, uh, to get in there. So if, if this is one option of what to do with this install folder and what to do with the, the files so that you can still keep using it, uh, David, in your example, in a, in a development environment, um, if you're local only development, then great, you're local only development. But there are plenty of times you're staging, you're out there, you're public. These things are publicly accessible. If you can lock things down, then you still are able to have your full unfettered access and, um, and still have it be protected. Um, so that helps if you're able to get remote desktop and you have a dedicated IP address. If you don't have one or both of those, you can't do this uh, particular method. Um, our next uh, problem was that we had several DNN locations where we did not have FTP access nor remote desktop access. Uh, we had particular locations with e-commerce systems where they needed to be locked down. Uh, those were cloud hosted. Uh, some of those were power DNN hosted. And we could have put in a request to have them go through and make some changes. It was still possible, but we were needing to act quickly. And in many of these locations where, because of PCI security scans or other reasons that we can't have actively running FTP, we have DNN instances that we might have a host level user, but we cannot get in there and make changes. Uh, so we hatched the idea of using um, some code that we had uh, really run with Xmod Pro recently to build uh, a module that we could install. At host level access, um, uh, we probably started working on this uh, on the 24th or the 25th. Uh, we had it ready for internal use then uh, shortly after that. Uh, really, um, it was what we were able to use to lock down these locations that we didn't have access to. Now, you have the DNN security analyzer that if you, if you don't have access and you can install the new version of the uh, security analyzer, it will remove those install, folder, uh, install files for you and you'll be protected. So that is a third option that's available now that we didn't have when we were going through this. Uh, but we created this, uh, this second option here for our locations that we needed to protect. Uh, we created a module and we've released it now on the DNN store. It's a free module. Uh, we're putting it out there to the community. Um, I will completely uh, admit and mention that many of the features and the reason that drove it are now somewhat negated by the security analyzer, which is a fantastic tool that I'm going to use and have already used on several sites. But I still feel that this tool has a place as well, um, especially if you install it first before you use the security analyzer, it would be your way to keep those install files that you wanted to keep and have them under lock and key so that you can bring them back out again whenever you wanted them. Uh, so I wanna talk uh, just a little bit about uh, this uh, item that we call DNN secure install because it secures the install folder. Uh, but just as a, as a description of it, what it does is um, once you've installed, you have uh, a big button that allows you to zip the contents of the install folder. You said or, this is on the store, right? This is in the DNN store, and we'll have links to it in the SoFry uh, location and uh, on my own modules location. But it's currently uh, published on the DNN store. Um, so uh, what this module does is uh, run a zip process on what you tell it to run. First off, um, your install folder could be named something differently. We assume that it's going to be called install. You might have already renamed it back or with your initials or something else like that. Uh, so this will install, uh, this will zip and work on the file folder that you name uh, within the settings. Uh, but just to run through a couple of settings really quick, um, you are able to choose to zip all of the loose files inside of the install folder. Today, our worry and our concern was the install.asbx and the uh, install wizard. But what about the wizard user? I don't know enough about that one. Tell you what, I'm just going to zip everything in the install folder just to be careful. So this zips all loose files. And you can click the button to zip. You can click the button to unzip. So similar to some things that are in other management systems where critical host level features are inert and turned off when you're not logged in as a host, this can be used by placing it on the page of the security analyzer, placing it on its own page, um, placing it at the top of the extensions modules uh, page, where you can basically click to zip when you are getting ready to leave and click to unzip when you need to come in and do some work. Um, but aside from the loose files, you can also zip the whole install folder. Again, 
I'm not the level of developer that I know or understand all the things that are inside of the install folder myself. I just know that I have people giving me a denial of service attack trying to hit anything they can get access to and I want to lock it down. So we can zip the whole um, install folder if we want to. Uh, so this works to zip and unzip. Um, if there's a previous one existing, it allows you to overwrite. Uh, basically, you first go into the settings uh, screen of this. Let's hit the settings screen. Uh, the settings screen of the module and choose the options that you want to have in place. Uh, once you've updated those, then the, ins uh, then the zip and unzip button on the other side uh, performs these particular actions. Uh, so for us, in a couple of uh, e-commerce related locations where we did not have access, this module was used to lock down those locations, but still retain the install files that we needed to be able to go back and forth and uh, do further things. Um, to one of Ash's points earlier though, I will mention, uh, aside from the install.aspx file that's there, any of the other ones, the install wizard, the upgrade wizard, um, I had another developer ask me and say, but I need those files. What if I want to do an upgrade? Every time you bring in a new upgrade, those files come along with it. So these files are safe to not only zip and make completely inert, but if you did want to delete them, they're good to delete. You're going to bring them back in again the minute you're doing a, a full install um, or an upgrade. Uh, but it's really the use of that install ASPX file that is used by several different systems. And if you have one of those, this would be a way around it in that if you have this zipped up, when you then use the uh, security analyzer, those files will already be missing or gone at install, so it won't delete them. And then you can unzip it again afterwards or zip it back again and go back and forth as you need. Um, so that is the, uh, the kind of the second item I wanted to run through. The uh, third one uh, then really is to talk a little bit about the security analyzer. Um, using it is... Uh, is important and I got to mention even if I'm not stepping through it because Ash did a great job running through all the powerful features of it um, every single one of those were steps that we were taking manually and in a in a personal process in a manual process the security analyzer gets them all in a row you can take them from the top of the list and just move through and know that you've covered many of the important things that we were doing in a scramble um, <clears throat> Uh, part of what I'll do uh, later on uh, in the blog is uh, write up a little bit of the after, uh, after effects or after things that we suggest doing or that we are doing ourselves um, from both a server standpoint and the hosting location standpoint, but also just from the front end of our sites. Um, even if you're not a fan of some of the other things that Cloudflare does or brings to the table, it brings security to the table in that it can also mitigate to a certain level um, a denial of service level volume of traffic. Um, if it hits a certain threshold, they'll still dump it right back on you again, but it's there. And you can also ramp up to the pro or to the business account, and they will help shut it down instantly, even if you turn it on for a month and then turn it back down again later. So having it in place before you need it means that it's ready there to activate. Um, so I'll write up some more notes and some more thoughts about uh, these types of things from there. But um, I'll kind of finish by saying that uh, you know this was a, a process that we ran through. I was mentioning to David coming in that we lost, myself, I lost about nine days of productive work uh, because nothing but dealing with security things and lockdown and checking on and keeping things running was, was my main task across two different time periods. Uh, but my crew did as well. So uh, we lost almost two weeks of development time that we couldn't afford to lose. Uh, because of what was going on here and a lot of the tools that are now available and the information that I now know can help you mitigate that or avoid that in the future at least from this particular vector and, uh, and method. Um, that's, uh, that's a lot of talking. I have barely taken a breath. Uh, Clint and David, do we have any questions from in the, uh, the community? Uh, are there any questions about the, the tools that we've made or, or, or any of that? I got one for you. Please. Um, you said you were working with sites that don't allow FTP access. Um, we How in the world do you manage one of those? Begrudgingly. Um, uh, there are a couple of very uh, tenacious um, PCI security auditors, and uh, they're the type that are giving us um, security warnings and letting us know that port 80 is open and that we really have a problem that port 80 is open. <laughs> 
Um, so um, they're hitting us on everything, and any FTP act external access uh, causes a problem. So we work on locking that FTP access down to our office IP address, except we have remote developers, they have dynamic IPs, so we keep opening it back up, we've got to shut it down again. And in those locations or the time period when it's shut down, we're not in charge of opening it back up again. We have to put in a request to the host who opens that FTP back up again for us. So it could be a day or more before we get access back. But yeah, difficultly is, uh, is the question, is the answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just kind of bring up the uh, the page for this here, um, but this was that second tool or that second method that I was mentioning that we uh, we put together. We've used it across DNN seven and DNN eight sites. I honestly don't know if it works on DNN six. We haven't looked, um, but uh, we have uh, it here free for everybody in the community. Uh, again, it uh, it certainly doesn't replace or uh, do better than the uh, secure uh, security analyzer. But I do feel that even in the presence of the new updated security analyzer, there are some particular places where this will be useful or um, useful to somebody else in the community. you got to have an XMOD in order to use that? No, this is a traditional DNN module. Okay. This is not an XMOD module. Okay. Um, Clint asks, because we certainly have a lot of XMOD Pro related uh, modules and plugins and, and extensions of XMOD Pro, this is a, a traditional .NET um, DNN module. <clears throat> where you're, uh, it says you got three reviews. Is that where the this, this for other ones? Oh, okay. Yep, yep. <clears throat> um, well, bringing it back up to the uh, the video here. Um, any other uh, questions or, or points in from folks? Um, if not, I'll uh, start uh, kind of wrapping up the meeting and uh, talking about what we have on tap for next month. David, anything? All right. <clears throat> Well then, uh, thanks very much everybody. Uh, we had uh, a session here today that was about security and about um, what the DNN community has done, uh, how it's reacted to these, uh, these exploits and how they were used. Um, we've seen official responses and uh, wonderful tools generated. Um, I ran through uh, kind of my diagnosis or, or debriefing of, of the, the forensics after uh, we had a breach, so firsthand I can talk to a lot of folks about uh, the pain of it or, or help talk about ideas. Um, but uh, hopefully that's uh, the end of that for this year. You know, we have a couple of different things where we might have junk users being created one time or another time it might be security of some particular item. I can tell you that compared to any other CMS system that's out there, we have nothing to worry about and nothing in the sense of headaches and continuous pain that other people have. Um, I think as a community, if we all band together and help each other talk about things that we're seeing, um, I think that's one of the main differences that we have, uh, that we can help make ourselves uh, protected and strong and keep each other uh, in good running condition. Uh, thanks, Ash, for joining us um, uh, and running through things here for the DNN security module. Um, I know that there will be a couple of updates to it, or I hope, uh, in the next uh, few weeks to month. Uh, so as those get posted, we'll make sure to post the links back out on our own site as well. Um, the next uh, meeting, uh, Clint or David, can you grab me a date on that? Uh, <clears throat> sure. I had it in another screen a moment ago. So it's going to be the 21st. It is the 21st. Okay. July 21st, we'll be having our uh, next uh, Southern Fried DNN user group meeting session. Uh, we will have, uh, if we can grab somebody, a recap of the DNN Connect. Uh, we might even watch part of the video there and get some highlights going. Uh, we should have on uh, Oliver Hine joining us to talk about NBrain, which uh, for me was one of the uh, new modules and new items that was released uh, back at DNNCon uh, Baltimore and um, uh, was pretty groundbreaking, uh, pretty earth-shattering for me. And uh, for those that were there uh, seeing that presentation and running through it, uh, there were a lot of exciting ideas exchanged. Um, I'll show off a couple of real-world examples of it, uh, some testing of speed and actions in place on older DNN sites, uh, but we'll have Oliver on uh, with us to talk about uh, NBrain, uh, to talk possibly too about the uh, control panel, and uh, run through those things as well. Uh, David, yes? Uh, Will wanted to know if there can also be a short session to talk about the password hash thing. So. Absolutely. Uh, we'll, uh, we're going to put that together and we will put that as a, as a new session. Maybe we'll uh, mention a couple of notes about it next time and then get someone to speak and present on it. 
I often say that he who proposes disposes. We'll see. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks very much, everybody. Oh, Have a good night. Oh, oh I apologize. I'm going to skip without a, without a, a, a prize coming in from uh, JetBrains. Um, David, you have a winning number here uh, for a particular one? Just a second. All right. Just a second. Uh, maybe a drum roll on a desk? I don't know. <laughs> oh, we got a hat in the room. You ready? <laughs> we got a number. And the number winner is 479027. I believe that is Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson. 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 Sorry, uh, Mark. Uh, this is you. You have won. Uh, this is your choice of one of the JetBrains uh, tools, and uh, there are. It, it's pretty much an open choice, and there are a couple in there that are uh, better and more inclusive than other ones. So David might even uh, point you a couple that he'd recommend. Uh, but. I'll, um, He'll follow up with you with uh, contact. Email. Yeah, if you'll um, pass him your email real quick, or you have his. Yeah, uh, he'll follow up with email information for you how you can claim that and uh, and get going with it. Sharper image. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Re sharper. Uh, if there is anyone, uh, anything else, uh, I'll go ahead and close out the session, and we're gonna go get uh, some libations, some drinks, and some food going on here uh, for those of us in person. Everybody, thanks for joining us online. We will see you next time. And, uh, and check the recap. Uh, check the recap uh, when we post links, notes, and information. Thanks very much, guys, for joining us. We appreciate it. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. That was cool. Stop recording, if you would. Just... Or you can use... Because I'm trying to get back to the control panel. There we go.